Okay, let's get started. I want to give everybody their uh, full amount of time. So we're going to start today with uh, Stephanie Moore. She's a senior hydrologist with Daniel B. Stevens, and today she's going to be talking about managed aquifer recharge beyond the ASR well. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everybody, for coming promptly in from the break. Uh, so my name is Stephanie Moore. I'm a hydrologist with Daniel B. Stevens & Associates. And just to give you a little context, I am a native Texan, born and raised, but I spent most of my, about the last 20 years in New Mexico, and I've just recently moved back to Austin, so fortunately the physics and chemistry and everything, all of those stay the same, it's just the people that are different and some of the regulations. So this uh, presentation, one of the first things I noticed is that, uh, whoa, that went way too fast, here we go. The main point um, of my presentation is that there are many, many techniques that are included under the umbrella term of managed aquifer recharge. And in Texas, it seems like, with the exception of El Paso and some earlier studies in the, in the mid-1950s, uh, most of the projects, most of the managed aquifer recharge projects that are happening in the state of Texas are ASR wells. And ASR wells are great. They're definitely a good tool to have in your toolbox and they can meet a lot of needs. But my point, my main point that I want you all to take away is that managed aquifer recharge is a term that encompasses a wide variety of tools and those range from the very low tech um, on the far left to the higher tech, which includes ASR wells. So here's a little outline of what all I'll be trying to cover in my 30 minute time block. Um, I'll give a quick overview of managed aquifer recharge and go cover some of the definitions, the alphabet soup here. Um, technical considerations for how you should decide which, if any, of these techniques might be an appropriate tool for your area or your aquifer. Um, then discuss some of the regulatory environments throughout the Southwest. And of course, um, you all probably know this, they're highly, reg highly variable from state to state, and uh, they're all driven by, by the needs of that particular state. Then we'll go through a little bit more detail of various types of MAR projects. And then I also want to touch on the intersection of managed aquifer recharge with the concept of uh, LID, that's low impact development, and stormwater management. So that's something that's come up several times lately. Um, and then finally, I'll finish with a mention of the newly coming uh, ASCE guidelines for managed aquifer recharge that we've been working on for about 15 years now. So let's start with the definition of managed aquifer recharge. It is simply the practice of increasing by artificial means the amount of recharge that enters a reservoir. And more importantly, uh, I, the bottom definition, I think, is something that is, is really important for all of us. It's just, it's really another tool in your toolbox. I'm not suggesting by any means that managed aquifer recharge is a silver bullet or that every district or every aquifer should go out and start a managed aquifer recharge project. That's not the case at all. But uh, as Sari alluded to yesterday when she was starting the conference, is one of these things, one of the reasons we have these meetings is to come together and, and look at all of those tools, see what is available available to us and just be aware of uh, what some of our options are. The other great thing about managed aquifer recharge is that it gives you an opportunity for to conjunctively manage multiple water resources. So that could be surface water, groundwater, reclaimed water, and harvested stormwater. So what are some of the common goals of managed aquifer recharge? The primary driver is water supply management. There's seasonal storage um, where water could be in injected or recharged on an annual basis and then extracted within that same year. So that's more of a short-term seasonal uh, storage scheme. Then there's also long-term storage. That would be like a drought reservoir. Um, that you could establish over a long time. Peri places like El Paso, for example, they've been recharging just a little bit of reclaimed effluent for about, since the 80s. And um, this year, they're planning on zero stream flow in the Rio Grande, so they're probably going to be extracting all of their recharge, their, their drought bank that they've built up over the years. Other reasons that you might consider recharge, managed aquifer recharge, are for an emergency supply, and then again, for conjunctive use, as I already mentioned. The bottom bullet there is aquifer restoration, and this might be something that we often don't think about, but particularly in areas where um, you have declining base flows, um, you know, previously perennial streams that have now become intermittent because of groundwater pumping or groundwater depletion, um, 
Managed Aquifer Recharge is a valuable tool to provide base flow in many of those areas. And then, of course, you can restore water levels, reduce subsidence in some cases, and mitigate saltwater intrusion. So this graphic is from Peter Dillon, who's one of our colleagues in Australia. Um, he's very active. There's a, a large international network of, of managed aquifer people professionals. It's called ISMAR, the International Symposium on Managed Aquifer Recharge. They get together every other year, and their upcoming conference is in May and in Madrid in Spain. Um, alas, I don't think I'll be going there, but um, I do look forward to their proceedings. And they, uh, this is a nice diagram that he's, shared, and you can see just a huge variety of managed aquifer recharge techniques. So you can have um, direct injection through an ASR well. Let's see if I can mark the pointer. Right here, a little bubble of recharge. You can have recharge into a potable aquifer. You can have uh, wells in alluvium inducing infiltration through the bank of a stream. You can have rainwater being harvested and recovered by domestic wells up in the upper reaches of the watershed. Um, you can even recharge treated wastewater effluent is often a growing, um, a, a growing practice, especially in California. Uh, so there's a whole variety of managed aquifer recharge techniques that could be considered. And when we uh, have the issues that, are, that we have here in Texas, um, it's just, I think we would be remiss to only restrain our definition of recharge techniques to ASR. So. So let's, um, this graphic, this is, I'm basically showing you the same thing here. This is a, a pretty graphic, right? A conceptual model of your hydrogeologic system and all the different types of MAR. And this is just a simplified picture of the same thing. So as I said to begin with, it's really, it's a continuum and it goes from the low tech on the left, very simple systems, surface infiltration, um, to as you move towards the right, uh, slightly more complex. And that would be a direct injection well. And, I really want to stress it's not a silver bullet, so I'm not suggesting that managed aquifer recharge is appropriate for everybody, but it needs to be, or it could be evaluated on a, um, let's see, it, it, not it could be, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to apply it, but if, if you have a potential need for it, you need to evaluate your site-specific hydrogeology, because obviously if you have a, a deep aquifer, if your target aquifer is thousands of feet deep and you have, uh, it's a confined aquifer and there's impermeable units between land surface and the water table, then obviously infiltration isn't going to work for you. And in that case, you would need to consider uh, an injection well or something of the sort. Then in between, you have uh, infiltration galleries and Vado zone wells. These are methods to get you below perhaps a shallow uh, fine-grained unit, but then still take advantage of soil aquifer treatment, which is some of the, the benefits that happen when water infiltrates through the system. And we'll go into more detail on all of these shortly. So for every uh, managed aquifer recharge project, there are three basic sources, or three basic components of a managed aquifer recharge system, and that's the water source, the delivery mechanism, and the recovery mechanism. And of course, there's considerations that um, you need to take into account for your region, for your aquifer, and for your water source, and for the timeline of your desired storage scheme. I keep pointing the pointer back here at somebody <laughs> instead of the clicker, sorry about that. Um, okay, so let's take a quick, a quick look at the regulatory environment for managed aquifer recharge in the Southwest. As I've already mentioned, and as I'm sure you know, it's highly variable from state to state, and there are many different drivers that create the regulatory environment. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting as a scientist, I'm a scientist, I'm not a policy person, but uh, there are of course, we all have to work together, and uh, one drives the other. And in, in some cases, we see uh, that we the regulations tend to be guided by the science, and in other cases, you see uh, the the practical com practical um, management solutions that are implemented are limited by regulations. And so that's, I think, um, one of the roles of this agency, uh, of this group, you know, and all of us people, is to get together and see what does the science say that we can do, and then. Um, what are the regulations preventing us from, do, from doing? And if, if possible, how do we revise those regulations so that we can do uh, what we know is technically feasible? 
And of course, it's always a balancing act between protecting water supply and in the environment and, and also here in Texas, the private property rights, of course. So I don't have time to, we could do a case study on the regulatory environment for managed aquifer recharge for each of those states, and, and there's a lot of that information available. If anybody has questions, I can put you in touch with, with references for all of these. But for now, um, I focused on a few different groups. These are the early adopters. Florida and California are some of the states that we saw. They're pioneers in managed aquifer recharge. They've been doing this for years, for at least the past century. And, uh, and we, it, the community of scientists practicing in that field have learned a lot from what they've done. Then more recently, and quick to catch on category, I've lumped Arizona, Colorado, and Nevada, and then also El Paso because they actually began some of their recharge projects out um, in the late 1900s. And then the last category is kind of slowly warming up to the idea, and that's New Mexico and Texas. And you guys, um, I'm not the expert on ASR projects that are going on here in Texas. Matt Weber and some of the other people um, here in the room could probably tell you more about those projects. There's three different pilot projects, I believe, that the Water Development Board is funding right now. Most of those are um, in the, along the coastal areas. And New Mexico is one that just recently, beginning in 2006, um, implemented, began to implement ASR projects and is having great success with that. So let's take a look at each of these a little bit more closely. Both Florida and California, I think the primary drivers for them were large populations and, and just desperate uh, desperate situations, low water availability, and they knew it. So they had to be creative and um, they, they both applied different techniques to do that. Florida began using uh, primarily dual purpose, so that's injection and extraction wells, and that's for seasonal storage. They have a highly variable, you know, most of their rainfall comes during one part of the year, and then during the other part of the year, they're completely dry. So what they're doing is capturing that water, and the storage aquifers that they have available to use are non-potable aquifers. So they're using that classic bubble technique where you, in, you recharge into a non-potable aquifer, create a bubble, and then later that same year, you extract the, that same water out of that bubble. In California, they had two different two different issues. One was population and lack of water. And so um, to deal with some of that, they started doing infiltration basins, surface and channel basins, and then also off-channel basins. And these projects began in the late 1800s, and some of them in the very early 1900s. And many of them are still ongoing today, and I'll show you a few pictures of some of those. Then the other issue that they have going on in California is saltwater intrusion, also from overdrafting some of their potable aquifers. And uh, then they have a lot of wastewater to dispose of. So one of the programs that they've been implementing you see frequently is high treatment of tertiary treated wastewater and then they're injecting that to, to create saltwater barriers to protect some of their existing potable aquifers. Then in Arizona, uh, the, re the the primary driver for Arizona is they had a much smaller population, right? But they get most of their water rights from the Central Arizona Project. That's from the other Colorado River over there on the other side. Um, of the Rockies, and they, they had all of this water available, but it's a use it or lose it water right. And so if they weren't using their Colorado River allocation, they were gonna lose that right. But they didn't even have the demand that would, that, that would allow them to use that right. So they had to do something with it. And they have these great big alluvial basins with plenty of storage. So what they decided to do was encourage recharge projects. And currently, the state of Arizona is probably, uh, has the least stringent regulations in the country because they encourage recharge. But also because of that, um, we've, we have a lot of uh, great science projects all throughout the state of Arizona to learn from recharge and how to optimize uh, infiltration rates in basins and that sorts of thing. They also are a leader in capturing rainfall runoff, stormwater runoff, and recharging that uh, into the shallow Veda zone. Colorado um, is a headwater state, as many of you know, and so they uh, have a lot of water and they're just trying to keep as much of it as they can in the state. And one of the ways they do that is uh, by implementing recharge projects. And some of these are uh, pretty unique projects that they are trying to maintain base flows along some of the reaches of the plat. And then New Mexico is one that I mentioned previously. They had, uh, 
major water deficits and major water issues. They had water rights available, but nobody had ever implemented managed aquifer recharge projects before. And so they were in the same situation um, that a lot of states were. We knew that it was feasible scientifically and technically, but the regulations didn't exist. And so it took a, a long time and a carefully crafted uh, plan to work with the, the right water utilities, and that ended up being the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority um, in conjunction with a grant from the state of New Mexico to fund these projects and demonstrate that they were feasible. And once that first project was funded and operated, um, since then there have been four or five other successful projects and those are all moving forward. And so, um, but I would say what's interesting about that is the first, that first project, they really had to bear the, um, the brunt of the financial resource and they were the, they were the guinea pig, right? So all the, they had the most stringent water quality uh, requirements and, and the most stringent uh, monitoring and tracking requirements to demonstrate that the project was successful. And then Texas, um, as you all already know, El Paso started experimenting with recharge in the late 1980s, and there were even some more in, in the Midland area, um, closer to the 1950s, some experience with surface infiltration. But then currently, the primary interest, as, as I'm aware, in Texas is through ASR, direct injection, and recovery from the exact same well. And those three projects are progressing, and, and um, I've been interested and hearing some updates that have been given around, around the state. Most recently, I think, at the American Groundwater Trust presentation. But anyways, those are all online also on the Innovative Water section of the Texas Water Development Board, so you can track those projects and see how they progress. So here's a few pictures um, of different managed aquifer recharge methods. You can see in the upper, uh, your upper left is spreading basins. The top right is stream bed infiltration. That's the Albuquerque, the first recharge project in the state of New Mexico. Then the Vado Sun wells and ASR wells are a little bit um, in, the, in the bottom left and right there. Here's a figure just showing you what can you expect. Um, you know, all of these systems are different. They recharge different volumes. Um, for recharge basins, about 10 feet per day is really the maximum. In some areas, you might get higher, higher rates than that, but this, based on our experience um, around the southwest, 10 feet is, is pretty much your, your maximum range. Um, Vado zone wells and ASR wells, you can get much more water. Uh, and ASR wells are, are definitely the most most capacity available. Okay, so now we're gonna go through some of these different types and talk the different types of managed aquifer recharge and go through some of the pros and cons of each of them. And we'll start with ASR wells. So that's aquifer storage and recovery. And that sounds like kind of a general term, right? You might think that that would include all types of managed recharge, but it doesn't. Somewhere along the way um, in the past 20, 30 years, it's um, been adapted to mean only a dual purpose, so injection and extraction from the same well. Um, one of the components of this, you, you need very high water quality um, to inject it into the aquifer. Um, there's lower space requirements, um, but also high energy requirements because you're having to apply, inject that water into the well at pressure. Um, it's a short-term storage cycle. So this is one, I actually think this is a limitation of ASR technology. If you're using a non-potable aquifer to store your water and you're creating this bubble, they call it, some of the terminology that they use, you see this target storage volume. So basically, you're putting water down into the aquifer. It's a salty, it's a salty aquifer, right? And you're putting clean water in, creating a little bubble. So you're, the buffer between the good water and the salty water, you kind of lose that. Um, so you sacrifice that once you establish until you establish your, your target storage volume. But then once you've established that, if you operate it on a regular scale, and you also have to have very good confining conditions, right? If you, um, if you it has to be a confined aquifer, because if not, then that water can move around all willy-nilly, depending on who, who is pumping what, and then you, um, your target, your recharge water mixes with your native water, and, and you're, you lose, lose the performance of the system. So 
a short-term cycle for storage, and then you also have to spend a lot of time optimizing your injection and recovery efficiencies of the well. And everybody that's ever operated a well system, which I assume is probably most of you all in this room, know that even just maintaining well efficiency from a production well is difficult enough. And so if you're gonna be injecting water into that well, then you have to have very good water quality. You have to have um, pretty sophisticated monitoring regimes to make sure that you're not entraining in training air, that your redox conditions aren't um, causing adverse reactions within the aquifer and that you're not mobilizing other constituents that are down there and, and that you're not uh, destroying your well. So just asset management is a, is a, is a big component of ASR wells. Here's an example um, of a ASR well, a direct injection well. This is for treated effluent from one of their um, advanced treatment plants. And you can see some of the monitoring wells located close by. That's about a 500 foot Vedosone, Vedosone and is that jargon? Um, Vedosone is unsaturated zone. So from land surface to the water table, it's about 500 feet deep. But the actual uh, area where they're recharging the water is at about 12, 1,200 feet below land surface. And there are many, many examples. As I said, the Water Development Board has several, um, has information about the projects ongoing in Texas. So that previous one was an ASR well, that's aquifer storage and recovery. And this, what I'm talking about, is aquifer storage transfer and recovery. And so the main difference is that instead of using a non-potable aquifer to store your water, what you're using here is it, it could be non-potable or it could be um, a potable aquifer. And the reason is if, if you have lots of neighbors with other pumps right next to you and you're competing for water, this wouldn't be a good idea. But if you're maybe a large producer in a region and you have control over most of, most of that aquifer, then you can put your water in in one area and if you know where the, where, which way the water is moving, if you know about the hydraulic gradient and if the water quality is good, then you can extract it from a different well, possibly an existing well. The other best good thing about this is that it allows you to have a longer storage time, whereas ASR, because you're maintaining, you're trying to maintain that bubble, um, that's a seasonal, short-term annual cycle, and this allows you to have a longer cycle so that you can actually get, uh, create a drought, uh, a drought reservoir or drought reserve. So now let's go on to Vedosone wells and trenches. These are a couple of pictures. Um, the, the well is in the top right, and then there's a trench down in the bottom left. So these areas, this, these sorts of methods um, you might use if you have maybe shallow caliche layers or a shallow uh, different confining unit at surface, and all you need to do is get below that. And then once you get below that, you still have a good level of the unsaturated zone or Vado zone, which gives you the benefit of soil aquifer treatment. And soil aquifer treatment is just um, essentially the natural, the aquifer materials acting as a sponge or as a filter, right? So you have a lot of um, attenuation of any water quality issues in that top, in that few upper feet of the aquifer. And so you're improving your water quality. The, let me go back to this. Uh, this is an important thing. The Vedosone wells and trenches, the worst part about them is a very a relatively short lifespan. Even that, even because of that, um, because it's lower costs than an injection well, they're still sometimes valuable, but really you're only gonna get a uh, five to 10 year lifespan on these. And the primary reason is that you can't clean them out. You know, an ASR well, you can go in and clean out your well to once you start losing uh, efficiency, but these things, these wells you can't clean out. So it's a shorter lifespan. Here's a couple of examples. This is actually a project built in 1912 in Southern California, the Lytle Creek floodwater project. And they made this shaft out of redwood lumber. Um, and you know, they, they thought it was possible and they did it and there were probably no rules that, <laughs> that they had the benefit of um, the wild west, I guess. <laughs> and so they could go out and do this and it worked. Um, some, part, parts of the shaft actually collapsed, but it was still accepting recharge. And so it worked for a very long time. And that's an early example of kind of a Vedosone in channel, a uh, Vedosone well system. Uh-oh, there we go. Here's another example. This uh, is an infiltration gallery. This is uh, something from a project in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, and these are um, 
just a distribution facility. This will be laid over with gravel and then covered. This is where they're gonna recharge treated uh, wastewater effluent um, into the shallow subsurface and then let it infiltrate. More recently, you're getting fancier schemes, these large underground infiltration basins, these sorts of things might be in under parking lots or in shopping centers or things like that. You can even do it uh, under a building um, or under a park or anything like that. So it, it's capable of holding large volumes of water, which is especially handy for stormwater management or stormwater capture, and then it allows it to infiltrate at a later time. And then last, so we've been moving from the more technical uh, end of managed aquifer recharge to the least, least technical, um, and that's surface recharge. I guess it's least technical because you're really just pouring water on the ground and letting it infiltrate. But it's actually highly complicated um, from a regulatory perspective, at least if you're in New Mexico, um, to track that water as it moves from land surface all the way down to the water table. And in this particular case, the first project there, it was 500 feet um, from land surface to the aquifer. And so since nobody had ever done a project like this before, they were very interested about if we could, if we could identify where that water went, if we could track it, and if we could demonstrate um, the timing with which and the amount that it spread as it moved down, as it made it to the aquifer. Um, and then these other two pictures, uh, this is an, oops, wrong button again. Sorry about that. This is, these are both Southern California. Um, this is Southern California, and um, this is actually closer to the Arizona border, large basins. And I've just got a couple of pictures here, how am I doing on time, um, that I wanna go through. Just to give you an example, this is 1896 um, from Santiago Creek, the Irving Ranch Company was doing small scale uh, spreading basins. And this is near the Orange County Water District. They're still operating recharge facilities nearby. And the Orange County Water District is one of the leaders in this um, industry or in the managed aquifer recharge world, both with infiltration basins and then also with injection and, and uh, saltwater barrier. So they're a great resource for everybody, for anybody that's interested. Here's another picture from 1901, uh, the San Antonio Creek. And at this, I might mention here, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but this is, it's not a new practice at all. In fact, since the cradle of civilization, we have information that people have been uh, slowing down water, right, in arroyos and in wadis, right, is what they are typically called in, in the Middle East, to slow down that water, spread it out, and infiltrate it so that you're just changing the, the, the rainfall runoff hydrograph, right? Um, but... And then there's also evidence of the Hopi and some of the, the Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere uh, have also been doing very simple managed aquifer recharge techniques for, for years and years. But the earliest uh, photos that I have go back to like 1896, <laughs> 1901. Uh, okay, so moving on, here's another picture of the Montebello Foregrip Bay spreading grounds that have been going on since the 1930s, and this is right in a neighborhood. It also creates wetlands um, nearby so the, the residents can enjoy that. And then again, the Central Arizona Project. And these are multiple basins. You can see the way that they operate these, they let each of the basins dry, so they rotate which ones are wet and which ones are dry. That allows, the, um, it allows you to maintain your infiltration rates better. Okay, so now I'm gonna transition just a bit. Um, all of this managed aquifer recharge is really just a uh, human modification of the hydrologic cycle, right? And we already do that, whether we call it managed aquifer recharge or not. Anytime that we add impervious surfaces to a system, at least that is to a system that, get, that, that gets distributed recharge, RON, instead of focused recharge, um, we're changing the, the natural hydrologic cycle. And when we do that, you can see that the more impervious surfaces you have, the more runoff you have. And if you can modify that, so this is kind of a nexus of what I'm talking about, the low impact development or stormwater management techniques with managed aquifer recharge. And it is um, possible, here's, this is just, I think everybody is aware of this innately. You can see the, pre the difference between the pre-development and post-development flow because of increased impervious surfaces. And I'm gonna skip through this one. You can see that in some cases, um, it's, a, it's a relatively easy task to capture runoff from your rooftop, 
harvest it, and then allow infiltration nearby. You can do it on a small scale, you can do it on a large scale, again, if you have the appropriate hydrogeologic conditions. Here's just another schematic of that. That was a lot of clicks. Here's a few more examples. I'm almost out of time. There's the San Antonio Creek, Creek Spreading Grounds Rehabilitation Project that's just off channel. It's using a combination of surface infiltration and dry Vado zone wells and trenches to infiltrate storm flows. And then this one I thought would be of particular interest because it's a public-private partnership between the Nature Conservancy, Fort Huachuca, and Cochise County, and the cities of Sierra Vista and Bisbee, Arizona in southern Arizona along the San Pedro River. And that's a, a migratory flyway of national significance with lots of birds. And the, the creek used to be perennial, but now because of groundwater mining, it's been being mined. And so what they've done is work together to create this project and fund this project through some um, creative means, including a large grant from the Walton Family Foundation. And now they're capturing stormwater runoff, um, reducing flooding in that neighborhood, and then also maintaining base flow throughout the year. And that is pretty much all the time I have. Um, I do want to mention the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, are putting out new guidelines or revised guidelines for managed aquifer recharge. Uh, we've been working on it for 10 years, and it's about to go out for public comment soon. So uh, if you're interested, let me know, and I will be sure to add your email to the list. Um, or if you're a member of the ASCE, I'm sure you'll get a notification. There's lots of valuable info in there. That's all I have. <laughs>